Welcome to Commissioner's Corner. I'm your host, Lois Leonard, and it's that time again, back to school. But we're still in the middle of a pandemic, and back to school never looked quite like this. Delayed, staggered openings, remote or hybrid, there's more concern than ever regarding our children's safety. So today, we're speaking with the newly appointed Boston Public School Chief of Safety Services, Neva Coakley Grice. Thank you so much, Chief, for coming and joining us on today's show. Good How morning. are you today? Thank you for having me. Great, great. Um, we have a lot to talk about today. But first, could you give us an overall view? Explain to us the basic role of safety services in our schools. Well, safety services in our schools consist of about 73 or so uh, police officers that are certified through the Boston Police Department under their Rule 400A. And what that means is they regulate our training and our protocols as far as our being, um, our uniforms, our, uh, the laws in which we follow. Um, we do have arrest powers in the schools, but um, um, as my, my role, I'm really pivoting away from uh, arrest, that uh, my focus is going to really be you know, partnership, uh, problem solving, and prevention. And that's what we're making a pivot toward. Um, but our, our main focus is really the safety and security of the students and staff, which in the Boston Public Schools. Well, um, you know, if I if I take um, a page out of my own book, I would say uh, many of us aren't even aware of the services that you provide or that you even exist. So members of your team, they must often feel like um, unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about the daily duties that they have? That's true. You know, just um, coming on this position a whopping five weeks ago, you know, I had the opportunity really to visit each of my officers at their uh, location, their summer locations. And the summer locations, you know, consist of the 16 to 17 food distribution sites that we've been doing ever since the COVID-19. Uh, uh, the mayor uh, set up these sites around the city, um, and our officers are manning them. Um, and uh, most people don't know that. You know, we're kind of the, 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 the greeters at the locations. We're supporting the volunteer staff at the locations, and we've been doing that the whole summer. We also played an intricate part in when we went hybrid over the summer um, at me at the beginning, the initial start of the COVID um, epidemic here in Boston. We are, were a are, are contributing factor in distributing the computers, us along with the Boston Police Department. So not that many people know, they think that they're, you know, you think of law enforcement, you think of just enforcement. But uh, we do so many community service uh, projects in relation to our job. And as I've, I've said many times that, you know, our officers are an intricate part of the school community that we are mentors, we are coaches, we are educators in some sense, we are ministers. I have some ministers that are uh, law enforcement officers for us. So they are really an intricate part of the school community and the community of Boston at large. So the people who are on your team, they come in and they're trained partly by the Boston police, is that right? Yes, totally by the Boston police. Yes, when okay. they're out 400A, yes. All right. And they have, um, are, is there one officer that is there every morning as the students come in? And does that officer stay on site throughout the entire school day? So that's the difference between Boston police and the school police officers. The school police officers, we're assigned to schools. So every morning you come into school, you're going to see your same officer at that location. And I, I like that because that brings a certain familiarity uh, to that environment. It brings a certain stability. You know, now you know exactly who to go to if you need, you know, any kind of um, uh, uh, directional services. They'll, they'll greet visitors or service individuals that come into the school. So we're right there. So our, our role also encompass, uh, you know, knowing the protocols and the access access protocols, which is really important moving forward um, when we do have the hybrid model. Some students will be coming into the schools and then, but there's going to be some restrictions on access to parents and um, other visitors to the school. So we're working that process out now and we're playing a great role in that and sitting down in those planning meetings. Well, I was very interested in that because obviously this year is looking very different than last year. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what what are some of those adjustments that you're having to make? You just mentioned, you know, the differences with um, what is allowed into the school or parents easily allowed on site. So how will your um, your team, uh, how will their jobs differ? How will they, what are you going to have to do to effectively do your job now? 
Well, I have to be a little bit creative in the deployment. So what we're doing is we're being a part of those uh, those planning committees, those leader, uh, the school leaders are having meetings and we're sitting in those meetings just to see one, what is the uh, the populations of the schools going to look like through these two, these three hybrid models. Um, so that kind of uh, reflects my judgment as far as placing officers. But what I decided to do, I think I came in with a, uh, you know, enthusiastic notion that we're going to switch everything around. We're going to change, you know, officers. But I thought about that. And I had to kind of pull back and say, you know what, just because of the anxiety and, the, uh, yeah. and, and consideration of all the change that's going on, that I need to kind of pull that back and really just maybe keep officers in those those locations that they were last year. And I think educators and the school leaders kind of appreciated that as well as the officers. But when I'm thinking about deployment as far as the number of students in the schools. I'm also thinking that we're also considering um, traffic issues. We're working very closely with BPD and their community service officers and the commissioner's office for BPD to really work out traffic issues because from what we're realizing, a number of students will be walkers now as opposed to the buses. So we've got to be cautious of that in the community. So we're working really closely with BPD with that. We're also watching um, the locations that have um, some um, special needs students. So we're really paying attention to, to locations of schools that have the special needs students. So I'm looking to place officers that have a special knack and familiarity with those type of students as well. So there's a lot of kind of brain thought going in through the deployment team this, this year. So Chief, let's talk about the biggest immediate change that's happening, and that's the opening of school itself. The date now has been delayed until September 21st. Can you speak to that and what that's gonna look like? Well, it's still kind of a fluid process, but um, as of last Friday, uh, I was made aware that the 21st, September 21st, is going to be all, re all remote learning, all virtual learning. Uh, and October 1st, we're going to be letting our younger uh, students in, the K0 to, uh, to K, we're going to go, let me say, I'm sorry. K3. October 1st is going to be students with the special needs, uh, special needs students. Yeah. Um, in October uh, 15th to the 19th, we're going to have our, our little ones, our little babies, the K0 to K1 and K2 and K3. And then we're going to do in late October, the 20, 22nd to the 26th, we're going to have our first graders, first to third graders coming in. And then November the 5th through the 9th, we're going to have the grades 4 through 8 and then 6 through 8 as well. And then November 16th to the 19th is grade nine through 12, our older young people. So throughout that whole succession, they will have school police in the building because we have the teachers that are presently in the building now preparing their uh, learning um, environments. So we have the teachers in now, we have service providers in, we have the janitors in the buildings now. So um, the, our police officers are, are pretty much floating in and also still manning the food distribution sites which I understand um, just recently that they will be continuing them on a staggered schedule as well. So that's still a fluid process, but as of, as of today, that's the information that I have. And if all goes well, we'll be able to stick to this schedule. Um, so everyone is remote uh, initially, and between now and the, um, the 21st opening date, uh, students will be able to test their uh, equipment, make sure they've got their iPads or their, I, uh, or their laptops. And um, of course, you can go onto the website of the school and uh, see all these details, because there are a lot of details, and it yeah. is com uh, confusing. In fact, um, let's speak to uh, a form was sent out to all families that must be filled out, um, and they get it's flexible. They get to choose if they want to do a hybrid model. They get to choose whether they want to do uh, Monday and Tuesday. Of course, Wednesdays will totally be closed down uh, mm -hmm. for cleaning, or right. they could go on Thursdays and Fridays, or they can stay with all 100% remote. So can you speak a little bit about how that, uh, the details of how that form went out and what families should do? So the form went out and it's very important. I'm not sure if the deadline um, for it um, um, has ended. I, I believe it's still, because I think I got an email just last night to tell you the truth. Yeah, um, I believe so too. So I think it's, that form is very important because again, to go back to my deployment, it kind of directs us to see what locations are going to have the most amount of young people in the schools. So that kind of, you know, 
uh, kind of helps me coordinate and also helps the school coordinate resources, um, meals, um, also for uh, which ones are going virtual, if they're going to need assistance with, with uh, technology. So that's really important. And also for transportation. Uh, for transportation, just to really figure out who's going to be walkers, who's going to get on the bus. So we're trying to get those forms in. So any assistance you need, you can um, definitely reach out to the website, the BPS website, and um, and be directed on that. Well, I know you are new in this position with the BPS, but um, working with our young people here in the city, that's not new to you. Can you tell us a little bit about your career before this appointment? Well, um, as I said Numerous times. Um, I, I'm born and bred in Boston. Um, I grew up in Boston, went to Boston public schools. I did go to a Catholic school for a couple of years, but we ended up going back to Boston public schools for my, my formative years, uh, six through nine and a half. And then I was recruited to go to um, Newton North through the MECO program. Um, but I still live in Boston. I still live in Boston. My family's here in Boston. Um, I went away to college in Virginia to Hampton University and HBCU, which has gotten a lot of, lot of notoriety right now because of our new uh, uh, vice president candidate. So we've been, um, uh, yeah, so that's extra special for me. After leaving um, Hampton University, I came back to Boston with my family. And it was kind of the same, similar times that we're having now. It was kind of a tumultuous time in Boston with the relationships to both police and um, and violence in our communities. And you know what? I was um, dating um, a police officer at the time, and he said, you know, you should take the police exam. And I remember my mother always saying that if you know if you want to be you want to be a part of the problem, be a part of the solution, and you could actually be that change that the city is looking for. And you know what? After 27 years. Um, of a career of really just engaging young people, engaging community partners, you know, being an intricate part of our community policing model, um, doing some really incredible uh, partnership and collaborations. It's been, a, I, I don't have a regret, you know, and I'm not really, um, I was talking to you earlier just about having that feeling and that sentiment of not wanting to seem like I'm just too overjoyed about this, the happenings in, in, in the world right now, in, not only just in, 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 this, in the United States, but really across the country about um, uh, policing. Um, it's, 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 it hurts. It's a hurtful feeling right now, the sentiment toward policing. But you know what? I think that for me and for me and my leadership with my guys and, and ladies, that this is an opportunity for us to do better. This is an opportunity for us to engage a community just like we did uh, 27 years ago um, in our models. I think Boston is a, a great representation of that. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to say you're being a little modest because during those years, you were also part of the Youth Violence Strike Force. Yeah, uh, yeah. You were involved with the Department of Youth Services, so the reentry program, Operation Nightlight, quite a few things in your okay. resume to bring you to where you are today. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, uh, you were also awarded a very prestigious award. It's called the Spirit of Molly Mentoring Award. And that's from the, uh, the Massachusetts Association of Women in Law Enforcement. And so I'd like to focus on that word mentoring because um, I, I think that's, that's playing a role from what I'm hearing you say today. How is that going to come into play uh, in your new position? I, I talk to my officers all the time and, um, you know, I'm the chief. I, I was appointed the chief, but I'm amongst many leaders um, in my in my uh, department. And I think as a chief and as having leaders that you have to really think about the forecast in the future. And as a result of that, it's really developing younger officers and developing this community policing model to really transcend the 21st century and to do better than we did uh, previously. And I come from strong roots, you know, Boston Police really gave me an opportunity to, you know, um, work with the community, uh, gave me liberty to collaborate in partnerships, and I'm bringing that same model over. And with that, um, I had a lot of mentors. I had mentors of uh, older officers that sat me down and that encouraged me to take uh, uh, promotional exams, to, to uh, go into the gang unit, to go into the school police unit. And I want to bring that same sentiment over to the officers um, that um, I've been tasked to, to, to lead. And mentoring, matter of fact, I'm meeting with my uh, female officers this evening just to talk about that same type of initiative of, of desiring promotions, desiring different opportunities within a department, 
working collaboratively with outside organization and also giving back, you know, giving back to the young, young, um, young people in our schools and in our community um, to hopefully lead into our profession. You know, you um, you mentioned that you grew up here in Boston, went to school in Boston. Um, I'm wondering, um, at the time, what was different then? What was the environment like? How was that different than it is today? Were you, uh, as a student, as a young student, were you even aware of any safety issues at the time? Were there? No, I'm going to tell you the truth. I, um, I didn't like police when I first came on. I just, you know what I mean? There was no, yeah. we didn't have officers that would, you know, that came to our schools or, 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 you know, had groups in the community. We just did not have that. And if they did, they did, they weren't prevalent in our communities. And I was really um, determined to change that and really to change that narrative and to be a, a, a vested integral part of, of the school community. And so that's what I've been kind of doing throughout my whole career. And that's what school police has been doing throughout the whole existence of them, have been a, sta a, sta a staple in the, in, in the schools, you know, doing mentoring, doing uh, coaching. I have an officer that, that coaches three different teams. I have an officer that uh, teaches karate. I have an officer that does cooking lessons. Like I said, I have a minister, a minister um, uh, that's an officer as well. So we're really already vested in this community. Um, a large portion of my officers live in the city, just like myself, um, and they have student, they have children that attend the Boston Public Schools. So this is like this is just not our, our role as uh, school police officers, but this is our role as community members. And so we kind of take that feeling um, with us each and every day that we show up for our role in um, in in the schools. And Chief, are there, um, there must be other organizations within the uh, city of Boston that you and your team will be working with. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, about those? That's, I think it, uh, we, we, when I was in Boston police, we used to have this mentality that when we had our gang problem um, here, we kind of faced that gang problem head on. And I think that was some of the, that's one of the reasons why we had some tremendous solutions that were, that ended up being the national model, the Boston Miracle. Um, and with that, that notion is that we partnered with any organization that wanted to work with us. We kind of, you know, most law enforcement agencies really have that us and them kind of mentality. And I think that's what you're kind of seeing now. But we have to go back to it's we and that we have to work together. And in doing that, you partner with organizations within your community that pay a vested interest. I was driving the other day and I saw Erica from BCYF, uh, the uh, Boston Families, uh, I don't want to mess up the acronym, but <laughs> I saw Erica, she works with the um, Youth and Families and for right. the city of Boston. And she was dressed up like a clown, like a clown. And she had a mask on and she's walking. I'm like, where are you going? I, I, I don't know how I recognized her. And she was going to host the ice cream day for some young girls in oh. Georgia. Yeah. So those are the kind of, you know, those are the kind of partners we want to, you know, to, to definitely have a direct line with the youth centers, the, um, uh, the ministers. You want to work closely with the ministers. We want to work closely with DYS, with DA, with the DA. We have a, um, a partner within our safety service team that does strictly the behavioral health and intervention and prevention. So we're working really to see how we can have a direct synergy between the officers and support in her role within the schools in the larger behavior service role within the city of Boston. So the Boston Public Schools, I'm sorry. Um, so we partner with all types of, um, and I'm looking to reach out with um, a lot of the community members I've had partnerships with, BAM, we're working with BAM. We're also working with um, Mr. Falk. Uh, he's working with the Athletics League. Um, we're also working with um, uh, let's, uh, uh, Big Sisters. Big Sisters huh? has always sure. been a tremendous uh, partner of ours. Girls Leaps has been a tremendous partner of ours. I just want to thank them for really just really advising me. They've kind of been my unofficial advisory board in this role, um, really just to keep me in line with young, with, with, what young people are looking for. And I was also curious about another program that um, has happened in the past. It's called Start with Hello Week. Uh, will that still be happening? And if so, how will that? What will that look like this year? 
Well, that's a new name for me because I, I wasn't familiar with that because what we did over in the Boston Police at, uh, with the BCE, the Bureau of Community Engagement, and um, under the leadership of Superintendent um, Noah Bastion, we'd always done our reading circles with the young ki- with the young uh, students. We've always done um, our uh, special guest appearances. We've done our High Five Fridays, done that. So we're going to piggyback on them. We're going to be in direct partnership with them moving forward, especially when all the young people come back into the schools. And... Um, even initially when they come back into schools, because I think that's why the models are constructed the way they are, because we realize that some young people need the socialization um, that the kind of direct contact adds. So we're gonna be doing our uh, our reading circles, our high five Fridays, our, our virtual reading groups. We're doing a number of different dialogues. I'm doing dialogues three or four times a week. I'm also gonna, uh, I can, uh, promote it now. Uh, this is, you're getting uh, Go for it. <laughs> live off the feed. I'm going to be uh, setting up a uh, chief's corner in which I will be uh, going through each high school and setting up little um, mentoring circles, mentoring circles for young people. And my office is going to be coming in uh, with me. We're going to be doing some visits, some home visits, just to make sure young people are on track when they come back into the school. So we got a lot, we got a lot instilled, and we're excited about this new year and what this opportunity for us to be involved in entails. Well, you're right. There, there is a lot to be done, and it is a very challenging year. And I applaud you for being willing to take on this position. Um, what can the community do to help? In your mind, what what can we do? What can families do um, to help support your team, the uh, the teachers, and and just help keep our children safe? You know, even my role here as a chief, I'm going to switch my role. Just even as a community person, I'm very involved in the community, and I listen to, you know, uh, uh, my, my, I'm a trustee on an our condo association, a member of my church, and just listening to people. I think communication is really key, sitting down with people and, and having them uh, be able to have a voice and include them in our decision-making um, process. I think that's that's extremely important. I think really just engaging young people on all levels um, where they are, um, just listening to some of the concerns that they have, especially even related to to law enforcement. Um, so that's what I think. I think moving forward and, and in the upcoming weeks, I mean, until we actually get 100% into the buildings, I think those continued dialogues, those continued meetings, making myself available, and really just leading by example, really being out there, um, being a part of the process, sitting in unorthodox you know, meetings. I'm sitting in meetings that some president Trump like, I don't know what's going on. I think after you sit and really understanding that they, um, we all have the same goal, the safety and security of the young people in, in, in our, in our schools and in our communities. And if you on that, if you come in with that premise, you come in with that mindset, then, um, we can't go wrong. I think that's a great place to leave it right there. Um, it's so wonderful to have you here. Uh, very helpful and great information. And we we wish you, we all wish you a lot of luck and, and support from everywhere. And I uh, look forward to getting an update from you down the road. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Sure. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it very much. And thank you, our viewers, for watching. If you and your family do take part in hybrid learning, make sure to say hi to your school officer. What a great time for your child to build trusting relationships with law enforcement figures. Amid the country's loud criticism of some policing policies, don't miss out on this opportunity for a positive experience. And we'll see you next time on Commissioner's Corner.